Well, I hope you've been blessed so far that this has been an enjoyable time of worship. I am uh, always a little bit uh, excited to see how the church evolves from when I first come up here to do the welcome, right, at, you know, f- five minutes after 11 till when I stand up here to preach. Um, when I first came up, this whole section was empty, <laughs> except for you folks. I remember you, a couple of you. Thank you for holding down this side. I did know that you were over here. But man, you guys just filled right in. This is great. And of course, we've had others uh, come as well, and that is fine. It's just, it's just an interesting thing uh, uh, to, to see how we gather, and that's, that's part of what we do here when we worship. Heavenly Father, I give you my heart today. I give you my soul. And Lord, I ask that I would be an instrument in your hands and that it would be your word that is spoken in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to share one more message on forgiveness, and then you're never going to hear about it again. No, that's not true. Every message has a message of redemption. It should. When you hear about the the work of God and the plan of God, there's always going to be that element. The year I turned seven, uh, my family moved. We moved from the little house that uh, I had grown up in up up to that point, uh, kind of in town, and we moved uh, to the country. I grew up in Yakima, Washington, in central Washington state, Um, and we were going to become farmers. Uh, they, they purchased two acres of land, and Dad built a home from the ground up. He was in construction um, until he retired. And uh, that first summer, when I was seven years old, was filled with wonder and adventure and all kinds of, of fun things. But one of the things I remember most about moving out to the country and being on those two acres, as opposed to a small house with a grassy backyard, is the dirt. You know, when you build, you, you, we didn't have grass yet. It was just a, a field of weeds, you know, that we bought. And they had to, you know, build the foundation. All the equipment had to dig up the dirt. The drain field had to go in and the septic tank. And so there were mounds of dirt everywhere. And this is fine, silty dirt. You could not find a rock anywhere in this field. It was just pure dirt. And for a seven-year-old boy, that dirt was paradise. I had a neighbor friend that was exactly my age. We became immediate fast friends. His name was Gentry. And Gentry and I spent all summer in that dirt. Now, this is not us. This is just a photo of boys playing in dirt. But see how happy they are? We rolled in it. We dug for treasure in it. We played king of the hill. Have you ever done a dirt clod war? It's, it's, it's wonderful. You can throw it as hard as you want, and it just turns to puffs of powder, except if you hit them in the eye and they cry and go to their mom. But that never happened very often. Um, dirt clod wars, digging holes in forts, catching grasshoppers, all summer long, the dirt. Now, here's my mom in a brand new house, new carpet, new paint, new counter, everything new, And what do you think she thought about me playing out in that dirt? She had a very firm, strong rule that summer, and that was you do not come in this house after being outside until I get to see you. And so Gentry and I would be outside playing in the dirt, all kinds of stuff, and sometimes we'd get the hose out, make mud, and ooh, just paradise. But then eventually we get tired, we get hungry, we'd, we'd want to go inside. And so we'd come to the kind of makeshift porch uh, deck my dad had built, and I would knock on the back window, and around the corner my mom would come, and she'd see me and Gentry standing there at the back window, and I can still see the look on her face today. Every single time it would be a roll of the eyes and a big sigh, Right? Because, and she still laughs about it, she'll say, uh, all I remember is these two dirt-covered boys with beady little eyes blinking back at me. And of course, what do you think she would do? She would open the door, we didn't come in. She would open the door, we would have to kind of back away, and there was a hose right next to the back of the door, and she would begin the process of hosing us off. It's crashed here. 
So I don't know if I've lost it or not. She had a hose, and it was a great hose, and the hose did great things. There it is, just a picture. Now, Gentry and I were different. Uh, I kind of, I kind of thought it was fun and funny, and so I would sit there, and you know, I would, the, you don't, when you're playing in the dirt, you don't even realize you're dirty. I mean, you, you just been playing in it. But I remember feeling the the dirt in my hair. I had hair. I had, I had hair when I was seven for a while. But I remember it turning to mud, you know, and just caking down, and the hose would just be up and down, up and down. It felt like it took forever. Turn around, back, turn over again, you know, turn to the side, hose and hose. Now, I would stand there and take it. Gentry was funny. He didn't like it so much. He would be moving, and he'd be ducking, and, uh, and my mom would, Gentry, stand still, and she'd be, you know, all over here. Oh, what are the beautiful times of our lives, you know. But the mud would come off, the dirt would come off, and finally she would toss us a towel, kind of an old, you know, towel that wasn't special. We would dry ourselves off, and she would say, now you can come in. And I remember that sensation and that feeling. It happened pretty much every day that summer I turned seven, of that rinsing, cleansing moment. And while it was silly and it was all those things, I do remember that feeling of, I'm clean now. Psalm 51, David says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Oh, to be thoroughly cleaned and to be able to stand before God and say, I am now able to enter into your home because I have been cleansed. It's a beautiful image. And David is going to spend time reflecting on God's mercy and his redemption and the journey of forgiveness in Psalm 51. You know, during our our worship time, we sang some wonderful music. Thank you to our worship team. Um... There's joy in the house of the Lord, and the, the last verse of that is, we shout out your praise. Remember that? We sh- Did you sing it? Did you remember singing? We shout out your praise. Did you, did you mean it when you sang it? So the reason I bring that up, oh, my voice is cracked. Oh, the reason I bring that up is sometimes I get a little passionate when I preach, Jeff. And, and last time I preached, I shouted out, And I even scared Bailey. (laughs) I scared my daughter. So I just want you to know, I don't mean to get overly passionate. Um, I'll check my notes to make sure I've got it in order today. But um, I do love to talk about the plan of God and the message of God. And sometimes I do shout out. And I mean it for God's blessing and for His praise. So uh, just a little caveat or warning there. All right, I need some help. I think I saw Toby somewhere, my son. And if I could have one more technician, microphone engineer, professional who would be willing. Oh, I see Ben. Thank you, Ben. I like to interact with the young people and and kind of get into the theme of the service with an interactive time called a kid's quiz. So if any of the young people want to help out, just raise your hand. We'd love to have you help. Now, King David is known for a lot of things in the Bible. What are some of the things that David is known for, his jobs or his skills? I see Abel right here, and then we'll come to Isaiah. Let's see what Abel has to say first. What do we know, David, about Music. David? Music. Wonderful. That's right. Isaiah? Musician. A musician as well. Yes. We want to give some others a chance. Are you, are you volunteering someone? Oh, no, we've got Adon over here. Adon, and then uh, go back there to Dylan for me. Adon? King. He was a king, that's right. And Dylan? Serving. Serving. Oh, he was known. That was one of his skills. These are all good things. You guys remember a lot. Uh, just one, one question. What was he when he was a young boy, before he was a king and all that? All right. Dahlia? 
A shepherd. He was a shepherd. David, thank you. We're going we're gonna to go ahead. And, he's known for a lot of things. Unlike other Bible characters who did great things, they're just kind of a patriarch or they, you know, maybe they were a shepherd. David's kind of a little bit of everything. He's wonderful. He obviously grew up doing the, the, the work of many Jews of raising uh, uh, herds and being a shepherd, but he was a warrior and not just a grunt. He was a, a, a tactician. He knew military tactics, leader king. He's a harpist musician. He's a writer of songs and psalms. Now, the New Testament will recognize him as a prophet. He's not really regarded as a prophet. He doesn't have the kind of the prophetic title that you would see in the Old Testament, but the New Testament sees God speaking through him in a prophetic way and, and being a great servant of God. So some of the, he's a shepherd, king, warrior, poet, heart playing prophet. You can intermix these. An amazing example of a man of God in David, yet he had his faults. How many psalms did David write? A couple of them, maybe 12, 50, 51, 73, 144. You can just guess, any of you, the right answer is one of these. Er, I see Eric's hand and then Julian up here. Eric, let's hear what you have to say. 73. Eric says 73. Julian, what do you say? 51. All right, Eric had it right. 73, almost half. There's 150 psalms in your Bible. Okay, so almost half carry the title or the identifier of authorship of David. So he's a prolific songwriter. He doesn't just write a poem here or there. Uh, he writes many of them, and some of the most memorable ones are traced back to David. Psalm 51 is David's song of repentance after he sinned against who? God? Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite, his family, maybe all of them. Okay, Julian. God. Julian says God. And I see Abel again. B. He says Bathsheba. Anyone else? All right, we're going to give Eric one more try over here. It's not that these ones were wrong, just... His family. Yeah, his family. <clears throat> You know, sometimes there's, uh, I see Abel, don't worry. Oh, Bailey, did you want to answer? Is she just stretching? Oh, say it again. All above. All of the above? Wow. Actually, Julian was right from the very beginning. You know, you got to watch out for preachers and teachers. Sometimes they're tricky. And this is a trick question. David, in his Psalm of Repentance... He makes this statement. Now, I don't have time to go through every element of Psalm 51, so I'm kind of giving little teasers in the kids' quiz, but he makes this statement that can be puzzling at times. And I just have one more, guys, so Ben and Toby, if you can just hang out. He says in Psalm 51.4, he says he's speaking to God, and he says, God, against you and you only I have sinned. Now, this, this creates a, 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 maybe some image in your mind or some some struggle even, it's almost as though David is saying, look, yeah, maybe I did some things uh, to others, but I don't care about Bathsheba or my, my obligation to my kids and my, my, the rest of my family or Uriah. All I care about is this right here. It can have the impression of that. It can make David sound kind of exclusive, like the only thing that matters is you. You're the only one I care about all this. You know, that's going to take care of itself. But really what David is emphasizing and if we can look at it from more of an inclusive way, he's saying, when I sinned against Bathsheba, she was your daughter. When I sinned against Uriah, he was your servant. When I betrayed my family, that was the family you gave to me. And all sin does ultimately trace back to God. Sin is separation from God. Sin is the transgression of the law. So David is not saying, look, I, it's not that I'm, I'm not sensitive to what I've done to others, but ultimately the primary relationship that has to be restored with every journey of forgiveness is the relationship with God. In the fifth volume of the testimonies, all wrong done to others reaches back from the injured one to God. Our primary role, our primary relationship begins with God, and as we journey through forgiveness, it is through understanding that our sins do affect others because they are also children of God. Therefore, David seeks pardon not from a priest, but from the creator of man. So there's many parts of Psalm 51 that are quite 
interesting, quite deep, and take time to really uh, uh, investigate. All right, last question. Now, this one, if you don't have your Bible open to this, if you're not opening your Bibles, you're probably going to have to guess at this. So to the kids, I'd just be interested in your guess. And I see a hand over here. Okay, Abel, and then, is that Mackenzie? Yes. How does the title of Psalms begin? Abel? A Psalm of David. He says a Psalm of David, but Ben is going to see if Mackenzie can help us out. Mackenzie, do you have a Bible? Okay, so you're just going to see if you can do it from your perspective. For the choir director. Wow, very interesting. All right, we're going to give Julian, right up here, Julian, the last one. How does the title of Psalms 51 begin? A. A, a Psalm of David. These are all true titles, by the way. So actually, and that was the last one. So you guys, thank you so much for your microphone assistance. I want to show you what this looks like in my Bible. This is an actual picture of my Bible. I know it's kind of small, and you might, might, might not be able to see it real well, but you see Psalm 51 there. Then you see the editor's title. This is not you know, in the manuscript. This is just the editors of the 1995 New American Standard Bible. They, it, they call it a contrite sinner's prayer for pardon. Now, a lot of Bibles have these titles. They're not biblical. They're not inspired. They're just helpful little things. <laughs> they're just helpful little titles, but you got to be careful with these editor's titles. Sometimes they're not helpful at all. Sometimes they're outright, outright wrong. But again, this, there's nothing wrong with this title, A, sinner's, uh, a Contrite Sinner's Prayer uh, for Pardon, but that's not inspired, okay? That's just the editors back in the 90s when they were putting the New American Standard together. The title under that, and by the way, if you have your Bibles, open up to Psalm 51. Look at it in your Bibles to see what it says. Under that, you see another title. Can you see that? What are the first words of that title? For the choir director. It goes on to say, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to, into Bathsheba. Now, on a, a, a biblical note, or just a little bit of a, a, a being a good Bible student, just so you know, there's a bit of a debate in conservative Christianity about these titles. They are not modern, they are ancient, but they're not original, okay? When, when Psalm 90 was written, that's the Psalm of Moses, Moses didn't title it, hey, it's a Psalm of Moses, everyone. When Solomon wrote his Psalms, he didn't title them. These titles came later, but they probably came when Ezra Coming back from the Babylonian captivity, when he writes his books of Ezra, Nehemiah, 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles, Ezra compiles the Psalms, and Ezra, we believe, titled them. Because in the Septuagint, the, are you following here? Is this okay? You getting it? If you need to take notes, I understand, Aaron. We'll, we'll go over it later. In the Greek Old Testament, the Bible of Jesus... In the Bible of Jesus, the Bible that every New Testament Greek-speaking person was reading and quoting from, the titles to the Psalms were there. And Jesus quotes from the title. Peter quotes from the title. When Jesus says, have you not read what David said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet? He quotes from Psalm 110, and he quotes from the title, has not David said. And the only place that says David is in the title. And then Peter, in Acts chapter 1, he says, is it, haven't the prophecies been fulfilled, which David said about Judas, that his house would be desolate, and he would go out and he would perish? He quotes from Psalm 69, and Psalm 69 has the title that it's a Psalm of David. So Peter quotes, and Jesus quotes from the titles of the Psalms. So, it would seem that the titles are accepted inspirational elements of the Psalms. Now, you're saying, what in the world does this have to do with anything? Why should we care? Let's get to the Psalm for crying out loud. But I want you to notice in the, by the way, in the Hebrew Old Testament called the Masoretic Text, aside from the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's the oldest version of the Hebrew text, 1000 AD, the Masoretic Text. 
These titles are actually the verses. Verse 1 of Psalm 51 would be the title. They actually included them as verses of Scripture. Now, why is this important? Don't miss this. This psalm begins with for the choir director. This psalm of repentance, this psalm of forgiveness is not just David in his prayer closet, in his, in his uh, 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 you know, uh, privacy, coming before the Lord and saying, oh, I've done terrible and I just, I, I don't want anyone to know, just keep it between us, Lord, and purify my heart, make me a clean individual. No! If this is inspired, if this is, if this is truly the work of God putting this title in, it means the intent of the Lord, the intent of David from the very beginning of the psalm is I want the church to sing about this. I want the church to know about this. I want the people of God to see what God is doing in my life, even if it brings me shame, even if it brings me embarrassment and humiliation. This psalm is for the church. It's for the song. It's for the choir director. It's something that we should all benefit from. Do you follow? Notice what Patriarchs and Prophets says. Thus, in a sacred song, to be sung in the public assemblies of his people, in the presence of the court, the priests, the judges, princes, men of war, and which would preserve to the latest generation the knowledge of his fall, the king of Israel recounted his sin, his repentance, his hope of pardon through the mercy of God. Instead of endeavoring to conceal his guilt, he desired that others might be instructed by the sad history of of his fall. Here's the principle and the point. If God has reached into your experience and through the mercies of his blood and the power of his forgiveness, if he has redeemed you, restored you, forgiven you, and blessed you, it should be shared it should be shared, not in all the you know, gory details. of. That's not necessarily what I'm trying to say here. But God wants His mercy to be celebrated. He wants the world to know that He is the great Redeemer. That no matter how great the sin, He can overcome it with His blood. Our forgiveness is meant to be understood and shared. David begins this for the choir director. Now, I want to point out again, if we are to embrace and, and accept that this psalm was written around the time of David's being uh, confronted by Nathan, the Bible says in, in, in 2 Samuel 12, we, we studied the, the, the sin of, of David with Bathsheba two weeks ago. So I'm assuming you've all seen that sermon many times on YouTube. You've just embraced it and you're just getting all the details. Okay, we looked at that, that story in some detail a couple weeks ago. Okay, if you recall, the punishment of David from that horrible experience was his child was going to die. But the child was sick for seven days, and for seven days, David fasted and prayed while waiting to see what God would do. Do you remember that? I believe it was during those seven days that Psalm 51 was written. I don't think this was a year or ten years later when he's just reflecting back. This was a man in great turmoil over what he had done, and I think that is the context of Psalm, of Psalm 51. Literally, as his child is perishing, he is appealing to God for redemption. And we talked about the, the challenge of understanding that a couple of weeks ago. So David writes 19 verses in Psalm 51. It's 19 couplets, statements that are repeated in, in kind of... Uh, uh, kind of synonyms of each other, using semantics. Nineteen couplets of statements. Those statements are broken up into five stanzas. Okay, there's five paragraphs in Psalm 19. 
And each of them is wonderful. And by the way, tonight in, during communion, we're going to read through Psalm 51 as part of our, uh, a part of our worship experience, okay? So we're going to read it um, verse by verse tonight as we um, get ready for the Lord's table. We're not going to do that this morning. I want to come right to the heart of Psalm 51 with you today and look at kind of this, the central theme of David's prayer of repentance here. Everything before in the first two stanzas builds up to the middle part of the psalm, and everything that comes after it is a reflection on what he has experienced and expressed in the middle part passages. So we're just going to look at four verses in the middle of Psalm 51 and see what we can learn. There's many songs that have been written about this, many ways of, 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 of using these verses in our worship and our prayer and our singing. And in verse 10, David says these words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast or an upright or a right spirit within me. Now, up until this point, David has used other beautiful language of redemption. He said, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, and I shall be clean. But he begins verse 10. This is right at the heart of the psalm, right at the, in the middle of understanding redemption and trying to express his heartfelt sorrow for what he'd done. He begins with this word, create. This is an extraordinarily powerful word within the Hebrew mindset and within the ancient world because only God can create. Everything else has seemed, had, up until this point has kind of had an external idea of, of wash me, cleanse me, purify me. Yes, we want to be clean both inside and out. But when he comes to verse 10, he uses this word create. Create in me. Do something that only you can do. Do something that only you as the creator God have the ability to do. And what he's actually doing is he's reflecting back on creation when Adam was made in his purity before sin. When God put a new heart in Adam, when God breathed into Adam that steadfast spirit that revived Adam and made him be an inanimate object to a living being. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And David is actually reflecting on this and saying, what I need right now is not just a pardon from sin, I need to be broken from the power of sin. I need the power of sin broken in my life. Don't miss this. Forgiveness is not just you being relieved from the punishment of sin. Forgiveness includes the power to overcome the temptation to get into that sin in the first place. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm going to start. I'm going to try again. Let me, let me try that again. God doesn't just want to pardon you and say, what you've done is wrong, but you're forgiven. He wants to break the power that made you do that sin in the first place. He wants to remove that temptation, and the only way he can do that is by starting with something fresh and making us new. In the New Testament, you see a lot of passages like this. We've been studying Ephesians in our uh, Sabbath school, a lot of great tie-ins with Ephesians. Uh, Paul says, put on the new self, okay, the new self, which in the likeness of God, how was Adam created? He was created in the image of God. And Paul's using that same idea, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Forgiveness includes asking to start over with a pure heart. David expresses that. Forgiveness is a prayer for a new creation. We can't just stay the way we are. We need to be made new. He goes on to say in the next verse, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, if you've been in the church any length of time, you are very accustomed and comfortable to understanding and hearing the term Holy Spirit. Yes, we believe in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles. And the Holy Spirit came on Jesus in the form of the dove. 
Most of the, the descriptions and language of the Holy Spirit are in the New Testament, but the Spirit of God was not absent in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God was there at creation. It was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon Samson. Daniel had an excellent spirit in him. The prophets prophesied by the Spirit. This, here in Psalm 51, verse 11, this is the first time in the Bible that the word holy is used with the Spirit. This is the very first time the Bible identifies the Spirit as holy. Now, that doesn't mean that the concept of the Spirit being the person of God and the Spirit, uh, you know, that they didn't think that the Spirit was God and was holy. But this is the first time, and highly significant, the Jews were extremely jealous about using the word holy. Only so many things were holy. They didn't throw it around all over the place. When David, notice this too, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he calls for the Spirit to come into his life, and he calls the Holy Spirit holy, which is just an interesting thing to look at. But this is the first time David, in his great remorse, in his great challenge of understanding how God is going to redeem him, he's the first person to call the Spirit of God holy. Now, there's a reason behind this, too. It's not just random or hap, uh, you know, happenstance. Is that a word? I don't even know. <clears throat> he says, do not cast me away from your presence. Now, remember, what were some of David's talents? He was a musician. Do you remember when he would play his harp? When Saul had the Holy Spirit driven away from him, and he was going through madness. Okay? The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. Now, the evil spirit of the Lord, we call this the permissive will of God, okay? As, as Saul grieved away God's Spirit, it left a vacuum, and God permitted an evil spirit to come and terrorize him, okay? We call this the permissive will of God. God doesn't send evil spirits to terrorize us, but God does allow. Kind of like Job, God allowed the devil to tempt and try Job, okay? It's the permissive will of God. But David was the one called upon when he witnessed someone who he loved. Now, remember, David, David married Saul's daughter. David's best friend was da excuse me, Saul's son. David, as we studied earlier, had reestablished a, a relationship with Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, and had adopted Mephibosheth as his own son. David had loved Saul. And David witnessed what happens to a person when you grieve away the Holy Spirit. They go absolutely mad. They go insane. So much that Saul would throw spears at David to try to kill him. Saul also threw a spear at his son Jonathan once to kill him. Saul had so rejected the Spirit of God that David witnessed a godly man the king of Israel, descend into absolute lunacy. And David does not want that happening to him. So he cries out, don't take your spirit away from me. I crave your presence. I crave your Holy Spirit. Because the only alternative to that is what I saw in Saul, and that it's absolute madness. I do not want that for my family. I do not want that for your people or your kingdom. I need your Holy Spirit with me. Have you noticed that our society and our world is getting just a little insane? Do you know why that is? If you watch the news these days, uh, I can barely glance at it and I just, ah, uh, you know, all these random acts of violence. I mean, people literally just walking down on the street, pushing people into buses taking weapons and killing people. And, and there's no evidence of drugs. There's no evidence of gang activity. They are just random act. People literally walking around, killing each other. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? What is happening to our society? We are grieving away the Holy Spirit. And the only thing left is a vacuum that the devil fills and leads us to a place of absolute lost situations. And we could go on and on with other evidence of how we are just losing our, our sanity as a society. And David knows how deeply he needs 
God's Holy Spirit. Don't take your Holy Spirit. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness is an appeal to restore your communion and relationship with God's Holy Spirit. So forgiveness is a prayer that your heart would be made new, that you'd become a new creation, and it's also a plea for holy communion with God. Again, the Bible says sin separates us from God. Not because God's angry with us, but because if God did not separate Himself He would consume sin. His glory and His brightness cannot be in the presence of sin. So for our own mercy, God removes Himself from us, and through the mercies of Jesus Christ, we can now come back into communion with God. So David prays, restore your Holy Spirit in my life. Then in verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. He means something very specific by this too, I believe. He's not just saying, I don't want to be sad anymore. I don't want to be depressed, okay? Throughout the Psalms, David has made it very clear what it is that gives him joy, what it is that gives him happiness, what it is that delights his soul, okay? Throughout the Psalms, you read over and over in the Psalms of David, the very thing that gives him confidence that he is walking with the Lord. I'll just give you one here in Psalm 40, verse 8. This is David. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. My joy, my happiness, my delight is found in knowing that I am your faithful servant, that I am in, 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 in alignment with your character couple other places in the Psalms. I know you're very familiar with these. The very first Psalm, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, also a Psalm of David. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Now, I know this kind of sounds funny. Well, let me do one more. Psalm 19. Psalm 19, he uses almost the exact same language as Psalm 51. Psalm 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The law of the Lord, and he just said, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Here he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And I know it kind of sounds funny. How is it that the law fills us with joy? Because the law teaches us about God's love. The law teaches us of the boundaries that describe where we can be to have assurance of of, of happiness and success in our life. And as long as we are serving the Almighty God and living by His law, we have joy in our lives. So when He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation, He's simply saying, make me your servant again. I've betrayed you. I have gone against your law. I am now outside of, my, of, of the relationship I should have with you. And I want to be restored to that. Bring me back into joyful obedience. Bring me back into joyful assurance that I am still your child and your servant. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation that I have when I know that your law is written on my heart. The law that makes us unique and special among all peoples on the earth. The law that defines and describes the heart of God. Your law is within my heart. Restore unto me the joy. Make me your servant. So forgiveness is also a a petition of restored commitment. Make me a new creation. Restore the communion that we have with one another. And I will renew my commitment to you as well. I want to be back under your grace and living out your character through your law. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. The last part of this is in verse 13. Then, after you do these things for me, after we are reconnected and restored in our relationship, I will not be silent. 
Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Now remember how the psalm began. For the choir director. Even as he's writing this, he intends that this sentiment would be understood and sung and expressed within the assembly of God's people. How many generations of believers have come to this psalm over the last 3,000 years? Again, David lives about 1,000 B.C. About 1,000 B.C. is about the time that David is living and he writes this. Over the last 3,000 years, how many people in the pit of their despair, in the, in the uh, evaluation of their brokenness and their sins, have come to this psalm and found a balm for healing? How many thousands, how many millions have benefited from the contrite and broken spirit of David? It was happening even as he wrote it. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will be restored. They will be converted to you. Again, it comes right back to what I said in the beginning. Your restoration, your forgiveness, your salvation is the best thing that's ever happened in your life. It is the most glorious experience any of us can have. And it's not meant to be kept hidden. It's not meant to be like, well, that's what I, I do one day a week for an hour when I go to church. I, I smile and I say, praise the Lord, and, I, uh, and we shout out your praise. But the other six days of the week and other hours of the day, it's, I kind of forgot about it. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Redemption is a gift through you to the community. God does not save us so that we can just hide what He has done and say, that's, that's all my goody-goody. I'm not going to share it with anybody. This is similar to what Jesus told Peter. Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail. Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him. And He gives Peter the warning, before the night is over, you're going to betray me. You're going to deny me three times. No, Lord, not I. Never, never do it. Peter, I'm telling you, It's going to happen. But notice what he says. When you have once again turned, when you've been restored, when you realize what you've done, when you come to your senses, I'm going to use that as a moment for you to strengthen the rest of the disciples because they too are going to struggle with this. They too are going to be uh, uh, rejecting and doubting and not believing. But Peter through this experience, which I know you're going to do and it's going to be painful. I'm not going to forget about you. I'm going to be with you. And when you have turned, when you've been redeemed, use that as a testimony to your brethren. I have failed. I broke my commitment to the Lord, but God did not fail me. He was with me through it. And I will sing of His redemption, and I will tell the story of His blessed assurance, forgiveness, a promise of continual confession. Are you telling people about your forgiveness? Are you still crying out for His Holy Spirit in your life? Are you asking Him daily to create you anew? Are you seeking to remain committed? These are the elements and the core components of people who are forgiven. They're forgiven. Are you forgiven today? Every day we learn new ways, new experiences that help us go deeper in our walk with God. But don't miss 
It's meant to be sung. It's meant to be sung. Our God is a great redeemer. The greatest power in the universe is God's power to forgive. Heavenly Father, as always, we can only scratch the surface and touch on a few ideas of these massive themes. And Lord, in each of our own experience, we have witnessed and seen different ways in which you have proven yourself faithful to us. Lord, help us to not shy away from forgiveness. The devil confuses and twists it, makes it seem like it's a weakness, that we should never admit a fault, that we should never confess an error, that we should never feel the need to repent. But God, these are lies. They are false spirits seeking to confuse us. Help us to learn from the stories of the Bible, the great stories of redemption. And ultimately, Father, as we look at Jesus on the cross, we see a Savior who delights in mercy and can save us even to the uttermost. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.